Um, Welcome, uh, Yulia. Thank you for accepting my invite uh, to join us today. Um, we will be discussing about the, the balance between time and quality when it comes to software delivery and uh, how companies are solving the uh, never ending challenge of uh, how to balance between uh, these things. So I've been working with many engineering teams and I've never found any that uh, is not struggling with estimations or deliveries on time um, or any type of productivity issues within a team. Uh, so we are here to address all of that and maybe more uh, today. Uh, and I'm really glad uh, to have Yulia uh, here with me today because I'm sure that this will be a very insightful uh, conversation. Uh, just a quick um, intro for everyone who's new to, to the event. Uh, we are organizing this once a month. It's a fireside chat with um, leaders in the industry who are uh, here to uh, discuss various topics, various engineering topics with us. and. Uh, connecting to our uh, vision of world without boundaries. This is uh, kind of like the learning without uh, boundaries thing that we, we want to promote um, so that everyone, regardless of their location, can uh, learn from industry leaders, can learn from um, the top companies and how they organize things and maybe uh, pick up something and pass to our own teams within any company we work with. Um, so we have Slido for the questions. Um, someone from my team will share it uh, in the in the chat here. You can use that uh, to ask a question and uh, upvote anything that you find relevant from people who already asked. And then at the end of the discussion, we will go through all of those and uh, try to answer as many as possible. Uh, as always, this event will go on our YouTube channel, so you can either rewatch it or share it with people who might find it uh, relevant. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Yulia, welcome again, and thanks for accepting my invite to join us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited yeah, to talk about uh, and like share my experience about one of yeah, the most critical, I would say, challenges that um, basically literally every company and every team faces. Uh, yeah, super excited to be here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite, Katerina. Great. You're welcome. It's my, my pleasure. Uh, can you start with a quick introduction about yourself, maybe your career, how you progress through uh, from developer role to an engineering manager role and coming to Facebook and Instagram where you are today. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I uh, originally, I'm originally from Belarus, uh, which is in Eastern Europe, and I moved to New York and the States uh, 11 years ago. And so when I, uh, yeah, just like landed, um, landed um, yeah, in New York airport um, at that time, I was, uh, um, you know, just like thinking about uh, what I want to do in this country. And uh, yeah, just like tech was something that um, I was quite passionate about. And this is how basically I entered it. So like I started my tech career here in the States. And um, like in my early career um, days, I was uh, mainly working in uh, like consultancy companies as well as like small startups, uh, like small but innovative, exciting startups. Uh, like the most recent one that I left prior to joining Meta was um, um, Jet.com, uh, which eventually got acquired and was focused on e-commerce um, platform and building a unique and dynamic pricing uh, personalized uh, to people. And uh, yeah, so like I was uh, tech leading the mobile platform um, at Jet.com. And then um, I got a reach out from, from Facebook at that time. It was um, four and a half years ago. And uh, yeah, they were telling me how great the company is and uh, that I should definitely join. And uh, yeah, I uh, decided to um, you know just uh, join the interview and uh, see how it goes. Um, I got an offer. And then when I got an offer, a fun fact um, to share is that I was quite hesitant to join the company because I was thinking the company is really huge. It's like 8,000 people. Isn't everything, like hasn't everything been built already in the company? What I would be doing there? Are there like real problems to solve? And so I was really slightly skeptical about, you know, like scope and work that I would be doing there. Again, because of, uh, you know, just realization that uh, like quite a lot of things have been already and critical problems have been already addressed. And then after I joined, I was like, oh my God, we need more engineers and we need more teams <laughs> to solve problems, literally. Like, I, it's just like such such a, such an exciting discrepancy that I observed between my perception of joining a bigger companies and where you actually internally already, you know, just like working in problems and realize, you know, just like the scale and like every single small, you know, just nuance that is not being paid attention to at a starter but really seriously taking care of um in big carps and like thanks and um yeah so like i joined matter as an engineer as a senior engineer and eventually um started to grow up the ladder and um at some point uh you know just uh, i was given an opportunity to 
try myself as an engineering manager. A cool thing about, uh, you know, just like thanks and big corps is that you don't really need a management experience to try yourself in that role. And uh, which is why I was thinking, okay, that's cool. Probably, you know, just like that's another skill that I could put, you know, just like under my belt and like see how it goes. And uh, matter is really flexible. You basically can pick any role. You want to be an IC and a developer, you can do this. You want to switch to management, try it for at least a year, half a year and see how it goes. If you don't like it, you can switch back to IC track. So it's very accommodating and helpful, which is why, you know, just I was thinking that it's an awesome opportunity that I definitely don't want to lose. And so I jumped on that journey to become an engineering manager. And since that time, like over three years ago, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still in this role because uh, I think I'm definitely enjoying it slightly more than the icy work i do a little bit of icy work just to not to get rusty uh with like coding skills and like continue staying um uh, you know just like um, on top of um solving like a deeper technical problems especially if the team doesn't have enough seniority on the icy track uh but yeah that's uh, that's a little bit about my career at, at, at meta that's great and this is my favorite question whenever i discuss with people who are in tech leadership roles and especially people who progressed uh, from a developer role to an engineering manager one um, and we talked a bit about this while preparing for uh, for the event. So, what are the things that what were what were your expectations uh, when you uh, were anticipating the role of engineering manager? Uh, new responsibilities, you said, new skills that uh, you could possibly use in the future um, versus the reality. And how did you <laughs> uh, how did you adapt uh, to this? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, I was a little bit probably quite over optimistic about the role. And I thought, you know, just like as an IC and, a, you know, just like engineer developer, I thought, oh, like, it's so easy to be an engineering manager, you can combine, you know, just like a million other roles, because the only thing you need to do is really grow people around you. And then when I switched to, um, to the EM track, uh, EM stands for engineering manager, uh, you know, just I was still continuing to do an IC job. So like I was quote coding quite a lot, I was, you know, just delivering projects, because I, like that's that's what I'm passionate about and that actually sustained truly just for half a year and then it started to you know just like affect my like management performance because while it seemed like it seems like you know just the duty and responsibility is really just around talking to people attending meetings in reality it's much more work that you need to put into the role and just like more responsibilities in regards to up leveling people like creating clear plans about what to do you know like dealing with underperformers and then you know just working on um, you know, scoping as well as goaling for the uh, for the teams as well as for the company ensuring that you are in track. So there is so much more that is happening behind behind the scenes for for managers where literally just like there is not enough time left for for the IC work. And so if in my first year as a in my first half a year as a manager I was doing some IC work and doing a lot of coding. In my second half I was reviewing PRs and devs and providing feedback. I, I wasn't really doing as much coding. Like now is literally just like 10% of my time I could devote to like pure engineering, but the rest of 90% of the work is the EM. Um, yeah, is the EM responsibilities. Uh, yeah, which uh, definitely need like a special, a special, um, special focus and uh, sometimes even more consuming than, you know, just like an IAC work. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I think this is a common misconception for everyone who jumps in uh, a role like that, especially if you, you don't have clear expectations or clear job description and you say, okay, I will try myself uh, as engineers. We, we tend to think that engineering is the hardest thing that you could do. <laughs> and yeah. then you end up with people, especially if you're an introvert or you hate meetings, uh, which is very common. Yeah. Um, so yes, I've seen a lot of cases where, uh, this backfires and then you end up with having the best individual contributor in an engineering manager role. And, uh, you, you have lack of skills, uh, in development, lack of skills in management and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. Um, what, what were the things that, uh, you did to adapt to this new role, um, at the beginnings when you, you know, you just wanted to, to stick to coding, maybe code reviews, the, the engineering part, um, how hard was it for you to let go of it and, uh, focus completely on the management? 
Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so what I started to notice is that, you know, I would perform my EM duties during, you know, just like regular working hours, attending the meetings, doing planning sessions, like scoping alignment with other XFN focus stakeholders as well as teams. And then like, you know, closer to the end of the day, I would start coding, but then that would overflow into, you know, just like three to three to four hours, like after work hours mm -hmm. and like that would affect my work-life balance. And that was the point where I'm like, um, is it I'm not as efficient or there is something really radical that I need to change and so I started to like slightly reshuffle you know just like my schedule I was like okay let me do a little bit of a coding and like I used to work in the morning and you just perform EM um, you know just responsibilities in the evening and that didn't work either <laughs> and then you know just like I was like okay so probably you know just I really need to double down more on like my new role and just like really let go like a lot you know just like I see work uh just set aside and maybe and just only doing some like code freeze time I could you know just like devote more um, more time uh, to 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 ISO work. Another thing that was critical for me is I think just because I had like I, I was an engineer, right, and I had different managers. Not not at matter, not only at matter, but even at other companies. You know, just like great managers and bad managers, efficient managers and not efficient managers. And so I had a very clear picture of like what's needed, uh, and just like what engineers need, like what I lacked, right, like what an ideal manager would be for me. And so that actually helped me, I think, to be. Uh, like to grow in the manager and where, you know, just like engineers are really happy to work with, right? And just like would love to, you know, just like um, half, um, half as, um, as their boss. And um, one thing that I truly value is I try to treat my engineers and reports not, you know, just like in this, you know, just like hierarchical way where they are reporting to me, more like from the partnership standpoint. And I'm very proactive in seeking feedback. Like feedback is something that I value to continue growing as a manager and continue improving and honing my skills is literally like every month I would, you know, just like put it on the agenda of like, hey, what are the constructive things that you want me to work on to ensure that, or, you know, just like there is a mutual growth as well as I can support you and we're not just dropping a ball on some critical things. Uh, that are important um, so yeah just like feedback uh, generally just like matter values feedback and I'm like incredibly proactive like seeking it and addressing uh, just like from the get-go rather than you know just like waiting until the end of the year and then asking like mm -hmm. doing it retrospective and ask asking how, th how things are not going so that's what helped me you know just like to adapt to a new role and um, you know just uh, I hope become a good and efficient manager that's great I really love uh, the, the whole concept of following, I mean, thinking about people who made an impact on you as managers and then trying to re replicate whatever works and what you don't know, just get feedback from, from people. That's it's amazing. I would love to have you as my manager. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, Meta, Meta is hiring. <laughs> Meta is hiring. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, just like would be happy to, to have you if, if, you know, there were some considerations about things. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. Um, following up on this in, in Facebook, Instagram, or any uh, team, actually, you can uh, also compare to the smaller teams you've been part of. Like, what were the things, um, some best practices and some bad practices when it comes to delivering on time or um, handling maybe tight deadlines and code quality or actually product quality, not, not just uh, code yeah, yeah. This is a great question. And honestly, I saw a different dynamic, um, like how startups function as well as like how big companies and corps um, where I can like approach, you know, just like delivery in general. Uh, so I think, you know, like, as you know, like startups don't really have as much as many resources as well as as much time. And so like they're really rushing through the things. Like in thanks when, you know, you have enough engineering support as well as enough resources, you're very deliberate and very specific about, you know, just like what to deliver and how to deliver things. And a great thing that I like about the current structure of our plan, like of our, you know, just delivery process is that there is a rigorous planning that is happening twice a year. So it's usually, uh, you know, like at the end of the year, currently we're going through this process. So it's usually November, December time where we're doing a retrospective of what we achieved, you know, over the last six month, months and what we plan to do in the next, in the following six months. And so like this planning session involves not just, you know, like PMs and designers, like engineers are part of that, as well as, you know, just like uh, PMMs, like product marketing 
marketing managers and just research team. So really everyone who could contribute, like a lot of learnings that we got from, you know, just like our previous experience, as well as focusing on like what's next for the team. And so this planning really helps to, you know, just instead of functioning on this ad hoc way, properly plan your time, properly plan your um, resources in regards to like mean stakeholders uh, who would be on the team and uh, you know just like main metrics that we would sign up for you know just like a total list of projects that we would you know just uh, take on so like planning is taking very seriously at you know just like big carbs and thanks in comparison with startups where things really just like functioning ad hoc another critical thing that I think really helps with the delivery is that do a consistent check-ins and so we do check-ins every quarter so there are four quarters you do a planning twice a year and you do four check-ins right every quarter and so this checkings are helpful not for just reporting you know just like to the leadership and kind of like an official you know just data like sign off of like are we trending well or not towards our goals it actually helps the team to do a retrospective how close we're to the goal and gives enough leeway and time to pivot and it's quite important because I think the biggest mistakes that actually some teams in the company as well as like other companies do is once you commit to something, you know, just like you go all the way in until the end of your, you know, timeline and deadline to deliver things. But it's very critical to during the course of like the quarter half or like project to look at the things that you achieved, right? See where, where, where you're trending, see whether, you know, just like you have time to run, you know, just a public test sometime earlier and get early results in the data of how things are performing and eventually pivoting. So pivoting is a big, I would say, um, a big shift in mentality uh, that, you know, just like matter has where like we do move fast, right? And it's okay to, you know, just like abandon some half-baked things or half-built half things in favor of like switching to something more critical or something that, you know, just like change because you got this new learning from a project or product uh, that you were tested. So like quarterly check um, is quite critical. Another thing that um, that's always, you know, just quite um, necessary and obligatory in this company is we do, you know, like like edge scoping. And edge scoping is not, you know, just like a one day scoping. So like it may take a few weeks, depending on the complexity of the projects. We devote and give our engineers enough time to properly evaluate the complexity and time needed for delivery. One other thing is. Um, public tasks, like not a single thing will go to production to our users if it's not valuable to the users. And that's the difference that I also noticed with, you know, just like the startups that I previously worked for, as well as um, things where in startups, you know, just like the product manager has a belief that, you know, just a certain product and feature would be valuable to the user and they would release it. I mean, we would build it and then we would release it to users and then look at the data. Um, like at Thanks, what happens and specifically at Matter is we would run a public test first in a small user population. We see the movement, we see how our user base receives the product. And then after that, we make a decision whether, you know, just we want to sunset it or continue investing in this. So we make a very educated and data-driven approach and analysis in regards to where we are moving towards and just what are the next steps for the project and deliverables that we sign up for. One other, I would say, luxury that we have in this company is that we have 80,000 or like a little bit more than that, you know, just employees. And so as a result, we have a large pool of like dog fooding, you know, audience. So before releasing that something to, you know, just use a base, we have a big pool of internal employees who can provide feedback and just like test the product early in the game. And so that's like, that's, that's such a luxury. I think that, you know, just unfortunately some other companies are not having. And maybe the last thing, critical things that I want to highlight is that, well, in smaller companies, uh, we really, you know, just like there is like one person that does like all of the job in regards to, you know, just um, the different tech stacks as well as like expertise. And sometimes it may take a little bit of a time for people to build the skills that they need for the project, but don't have um, a big corpse, you know, just because the variety and the pool of, you know, just like people in place and skills is so large that, you know, just we don't, sometimes you don't need to learn skills. You would go if you need some, for example, ranking support, like my team, my teams don't have ranking or ML engineers. And if we need ranking support, we would go to that team and ask for their expertise and ask to partner with us for a specific time frame to help us get you know, some products out of the door. And so that actually also helps with the delivery. So because you can use the best expertise built outside of your team, partnering it with what you can provide to move the product forward and get it out of the door faster. So this is the main challenge. I mean, this is the main differences between, I would say, you know, like smaller companies and larger companies in regards to like delivery and like managing priorities.
it's interesting how we mentioned partnering. It's like having smaller organizations within the organization. How, how does the team collaboration usually work? Yeah, so it's actually a part of the planning sessions as well. So like you plan in advance what you plan to deliver within the half and you identify you as a manager together, you know, just like with other uh, team staker, stakeholders such as PM, like what type of resources do you have and what type of support do you need? And so that's where usually, you know, just like at the end of the half and, you know, just like mid, uh, at the end of the, um, at the end of the previous half as well as like mid-year uh, during planning sessions, we clearly outline that, hey, my team has the skills and, uh, you know, just like I need a support from like X, Y, Z teams. And then I would go and just, you know, like pitch my roadmap and just pitch, you know, like the importance of the work that we plan going forward and ask for X number of engineers to basically create some type of like virtual team. Like this concept is quite common where like a virtual team where you're not really permanently bringing a person to join your team, but you basically bring a skill, like a person with the skills that, you know, just um, your team currently doesn't have to partner to ensure that that we get enough support. And so like during the planning sessions, we have an explicit asks and a lot of, you know, just like alignments and collaborations and planning sessions with the teams that we need support from. So it's again, it, like a well-structured process where, uh, yeah, just um, we plan things in advance and ex being very explicit about how many end support we would need. What's the timeline? Is it a collaboration just for a few months for the whole half, maybe for the whole year? And uh, yeah, and then like there is a mutual leadership alignment, whether this makes sense and the priorities to where they should be maybe it's on a smaller scale but startups also can can take a good example from this because i think the planning uh, it it doesn't have to be done on uh, a half a year it can be you know much shorter and then you can have monthly checkups uh, to Absolutely. see how things go especially the retrospectives i mean that's uh yeah it, it's something that really resonated with me and i i also think about uh rolling it uh, into our own team Absolutely. Yes, definitely. I mean, you don't need to be big to do proper planning, right? I think planning and retros are quite critical. Retros in terms of like, you know, regular check-ins to see how you're trending. Uh, because yeah, sometimes you might be really going for the North Star, but along the way, there are really great insights and learnings that you get to, which might indicate that the North Star is not in that direction, but you have <laughs> to go right or left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nicely put. Uh, great. Let's see what else we have. Uh, when it comes to to day to days, like uh, you are working now on uh, some, you you have a sprint. Uh, you are you using Scrum? Well, it's actually, Meta is also very supportive in regards to, you know, just uh, giving a lot of flexibility to teams to define, you know, just like mm -hmm. how uh, how you would go around, you know, just planning as well as execution. So some teams are relying just, you know, just on um, Scrum and like sprint planning. Some teams really don't prefer to do this. A lot depends also on the size of the orgs. Some orgs can be like teams can be as small as like, you know, like seven people. And so like, it's easy, you know, just like to organize um, planning uh, just, you know, like traditional uh, scrum a fashion but like some you know teams might involve like 20 people and like at that point there was you know just more of a pod connections so it's really I would say matter is really supportive in like what works best for the team there is no unofficial guidance or well, like there is no you know just like two weeks sprint that the company like follows no like it's 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 very team specific like org and product specific mm -hmm. so when you when you said the priorities uh, every manager decides how to deal with things with their own team um, and what happens, so are you tracking progress on quarterly basis or is it more of a, on shorter terms to check whether you're on, on track? How does that go? Yeah, so like uh, in my specific teams, we are checking on things on a, on a weekly basis. So we're checking on the progress on a weekly basis, but then there is, you know, just like official reporting in regards to, you know, just like a bigger picture, right? Because on a weekly basis, it's really kind of like hard or like maybe not as um, you know, data driven uh, in regards to making a decision whether you're moving in the right direction or not. And so like for a bigger picture of like, hey, are we achieving what we are, like what we plan to achieve? Are we making sure that the goal that we set at the beginning of the half 
is really, you know, just like the right one and this specific project contributing to this goal. And we're increasing some of the metrics that we would expect. This type of check-ins are happening on a quarterly basis. But in regards to like a clean, like an, an execution, like milestones completion within the team, like my teams are doing this on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's not that the manager, you know, just decides how to do this. It's actually, again, like I like to structure my teams in a way where there is no, you know, just like a direct, I would say order of like, hey, we're going to do this this way. It's more of like, hey, what works for the team? And uh, sometimes, you know, just we can be like it, all of the engineers are very um, a very, you know, just aware that there is uh, feedback that they could share in regards to like, hey, this thing doesn't work for our team, we should probably try something different. So it's more like, I am looking to, you know, just like what makes my teams efficient, rather than, you know, just like, what's the best, like, you know, just working, um, working structure and like um, adopted in the industry. So like for our team, weekly check-ins make sense uh, where we uh, track the progress and just like discuss the blockers, discuss the main risks and things that we need to address, things that they go, that they're going, that are going well and things that we need to uh, revisit. Uh, yeah, but just broader ones happen on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. And at, at one, what point do you notice that uh, something is off? Uh, for example, if you have some target targets, uh, you have some milestones, some things to complete uh, for the quarter, and then uh, during these check-ins, you realize that uh, things are off track. Uh, how first? The first question is, how do you notice that? Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, what actions do you take to make sure that uh, you will deliver on time? Whether it's reprioritization, discoping, anything else. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I always try to, you know, just um, uh, do um, as a, you know, just like first critical thing for our team is to run a public test as soon as possible, because we can hypothesize how successful the product would be, but without real data, right, from our users and just feedback that we can get in regards to do they like it, does it, do they dislike it? Like how many impressions, for example, a certain product gets? Like do people are really using it? Like what's the percentage of the users? Who are those users who are using it versus users who are not using this product? You know, just like at what time of the day they're using it? So like different perspectives and different data helps us understand whether we're building something valuable. And so I always focus on like building MVP in their next month to two months and then run a test and then can collect the data and like get feedback. And so based on that, but, uh, you know, just like we evaluate, there is like a, a meeting together with our data scientist, as well as like product manager, as well as the designers, where we'll look at the data and, you know, just like if we see that the product is moving, like the data proves us that our assumptions are still on the right trajectory, we would continue investing in like enriching the feature, like maybe, you know, just like optimizing it, like building it in a more holistic way, and then just moving forward. But if, for example, you're running an MVP test and you see that nobody is using it, or that there is a really negative feedback bag and where it regresses, you know, like key metrics that the company values, you know, just such as sessions or time spent, right? It's a clear signal that you either need to revisit the product drastically uh, in regards to like the experience that you're providing to people, or it's time to pivot. And I think one thing that this company truly values and like very critical, uh, like generally for, for the performance is that like to kill things early in the game is also impact, right? It's better to kill things, you know, after two months of execution rather than sp spend the whole half driving something to completion and not bring any value to the users or like to the company. So like, which is why, you know, just it's never, it's never viewed as seen as a bad thing when you are sunsetting certain things. As long as you got learnings, as long as you share them broadly with the team that, hey, our assumptions were X, Y, Z, but our learnings and data showed us that the product is actually brought us uh, you know, just ABC results and, you know, like learning from this, like that's a great outcome. And it's never, you know, just uh, a failure when you pivot, like moving faster and pivoting is a good thing. And it's okay to kill things, you know, just along the way, rather than, you know, just wasting engineering resources and time and, you know, like bandwidth, just working on something that won't bring any benefit or like impact for the company or users. And when you kill something early, how do you go about reprioritizing for, for the half? for example. 
Yeah, so usually if you're sunsetting, uh, so uh, during the planning, um, you know, there is a list of, you know, just priorities, right? And so like usually we have a list of, you know, just like P zeros and like core goals that we are trying to achieve and like projects that we commit to deliver. And then P1s and P2s are so, like P1s and P2s are considered to be stretch goals. And these are the things that, you know, just kind of like sitting on the bench uh, for cases when things need to, you know, just like things need to get reprioritized among all of the P zeros. And so if something gets sunset, like we just do reprioritization of like, oh, if that assumption didn't print out as we expected, let's look at the list of things that we had on the backlog and just like plan B and C that we outlined for cases, uh, you know, just like this. So, and usually we would take, you know, just a few weeks, potentially a month to revisit the direction and it's totally fine. So like nobody expects you, you know, just like to consistent, like to all the time code and deliver something. Right. Sometimes it's okay to take a step back, revisit what you've done and, you know, just get um, an alignment within the team of like what's next. So like it's a very common process. Sometimes even goals are being dropped. For example, if you're committing to one goal at the beginning of the half, but you realize that, you know, just uh, with all of the learnings that you got, um, you know, in the subsequent or like following months that this is not really the right direction for the company. Sometimes we can revisit goals and just drop them or like pivot them. So it's a very, it's, it's an ongoing process. Like we're very dynamic in regards to, um, uh, in regards to like execution as well as deliverables. So it's planning is a very, I would say a very, um, a very directional um, uh, standpoint in regards to what's the North Star we want to we get to until the end of the half. But during the course of the half, like uh, we're pivoting um, quite often. And uh, have you had a case when, um, in, in terms of team capacity, like you, you have certain priorities that need to be done for the quarter, and then you realize that uh, you are not going to make it um, tech-wise? Uh, what, what happens then? How, how do you handle that? Yeah, I would say it doesn't really happen during the planning. It happens more often when the scope creep happens. For example, uh, so because during the planning, you, you 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 as a manager, like it's your job to actually plan accordingly and it's, uh, like allocate resources properly based on you know just the projects and priorities that you outlined. But during the course of the half, there might be some learnings where like oh, in addition to hit our goal, we learned um, this critical insight, and in order to ensure that we can continue growing in this direction, we need to add like two more projects. And when that happens, obviously Obviously, you know, just we can't achieve that with, you know, just like the in initial planning and with the resources that we have. And there are multiple things that you can do. One of the things that Matter is really flexible with is you can ask for extra support from the sister teams because the company is structured in a way where we have an org and org is kind of like focusing on, you know, just like similar adjacent products, right? And then there are some, some, some teams, teams and some pillars. And so it's a normal thing where I could come, for example, to my sister team and would be, hey, there is like a P0 that came, you know, just recently and we need some extra resources. Do you have someone who could help us with? So like that's one outcome that if you really wanted to make sure that you were adding something to the current roadmap and that increases the scope, you definitely need more resources. And you can work with a partner like sister teams to bring support. Sometimes it's all about, you know, just like killing things that are less impactful and prioritizing things that are more impactful. And this is where close collaboration with a data scientist is quite critical. We do this process of a t-shirt sizing. What it means where we outline all of the things that we plan to achieve, and then the data scientists would do projections out of all of those things that we have in our list, which are the ones that could bring most value and more impact in comparison with others. And so like based on this educated estimate and you know just evaluation, uh, we are able to prioritize in what order we would build things. Another thing that I think we as and engineers kind of sometimes really bad about is pushing back. And so like that's something that we should start doing more often. And I always talk with my engineers that, hey, as we sign, like if every time we sign up for an MVP and there is a scope creep in regards to, oh, we need this extra feature or extra design risking or something else, it's okay to push back, right? Because at the end of the day, if you continue uh, agreeing and adding things to the plate that you already have, the timeline, you know, will always get pushed further, right? And so that actually limits an opportunity to run a public test earlier and like get early signals about how successful the product is. And so pushing back as, uh, you know, just engineering team and being very firm about, hey, this is the MVP. It's critical for us to get it out of the door to get early earnings. And then we can add another 1 million things and features of the product managers and designers want us to add. Yeah. 
is also like a good, I would say, working model that, you know, like sometimes, uh, you know, just like we're bad about because we want to, you know, like accommodate everyone and build whatever, you know, just everyone wants around us. Um, so yeah, that's another trick that I'm, you know, just using on my teams, like locking the scope and trying to be very transparent that, uh, you know, just like the next iteration would have the features, but like we're not increasing um, the scope for the for the current like immediate list of things that we plan to deliver. Uh, we talk a, a lot about the public testing. Uh, what do you suggest uh, smaller companies can do that are not, or uh, companies that are not consumer face, consumer facing? Uh, that cannot learn so fast uh, from the users? How should we try to mimic that part to, to get more insights? Yeah, great feedback. I mean, great question. So honestly, I believe that the industry is like so far ahead where there are so many platforms that provide you an opportunity to do public testing. And um, so it's like Google has great, you know, just like testing framework, which I, we actually used in my previous startups, uh, which helps us to, you know, just like understand some early signals. Obviously, it might not be as detailed as, you know, just like the frameworks that you built, you know, just in-house, but definitely enough to see at least the movements and like positive negative trends. Another thing is if we're talking about mobile world, like always having this like, you know, just like alpha and beta users uh, whom you will always feed, you know, just products um, earlier in the game and features earlier in the game, just to collect the feedback. If the company has an opportunity to bring some PMM, PMM is a function that we have in the company. It's product marketing ma manager, where they actually reach out to some of our users and creators and, you know, some of uh, the cohorts of uh, population that we would love to collect feedback to proactively ask about how they feel about the feature. So it's more of a manual way. It's not really scalable, right? Because if you think about this, you can't really reach out to one, 1 million users to collect feedback. It's a little bit harder at that scale. But the list get some early signals about how the user base uh, feels about drastic and radical changes that you're bringing to your product is quite valuable. Um, yeah, so like I think those things would, uh, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. That's great. I was sure that this will be very insightful and it's proving that. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but I definitely understand all of the limitations of like startups and like small companies. Yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes you just don't have a luxury, you know, just like to scale as quickly and just have as many resources um, and like tools um, that, you know, just bigger corps have. Mm -hmm. Right. But just uh, adapting some things and it, it goes uh, the other way around as well. Right. So uh, you mentioned pivoting all the time. This is uh, completely startup uh, type of thing you know when a big company still tries to pivot and tries to test so uh keeps the agility um and i think that both corporations can learn from startups in terms of keeping uh, staying agile staying uh, lean and trying to uh keep coming with with new things and test them with users and on the other side startups can learn from corporations about how to structure their teams and how to improve uh, productivity and performance by trying to at least adapt some of the things that uh, work in, in corporations. So I think it's, you know, we can all learn from each other. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a never ending process, learning for sure. And when it comes to estimation, so this is uh, a bit more hands-on uh, thing, but I think it's something that um, everyone struggles with. I mean, engineers, uh, I haven't seen an accurate estimation. Uh, and I think a lot of people dread it. So uh, this is something that I really wanted to focus on. What are the things that uh, you advise when, or imagine uh, having to mentor um, someone new and uh, help them with, with estimations and uh, understanding the process of estimating properly? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so I think we as engineers, right, and just like engineering teams really have this scene of like, so if, if if a feature product is being put in our queue uh, to work on and you're like, oh, I'll spend a day, you know, just like scoping and then like the next day I'll start execution. And so here is, I think, a really um, great opportunity for you to start baking a little bit more time for that because... Um, as we all know, like you're jumping directly to execution, you are not properly evaluating and estimating all of the limitations that you might face. And so I always work with the engineers of at least doing a few weeks of scoping, especially for the most complex things. So in scoping shouldn't really involve just the product and features and, you know, just like APIs that you need to create for new things. One of the most critical things that I think a lot of people are overseeing is you need to look at the stability 
at the scalability of the current platform that you're going to build on top of, right? And you need to identify what are those edge cases and corners that you would hit. Is there is like tons of spaghetti code that you would need to untangle in order to, you know, to build your features on top of this. And so it's quite critical to have edge scoping, uh, specifically product um, focused and edge scoping and milestones outlined specifically on potentially some refactors that you have to do along the way. Because the majority of the cases, like the things are getting delayed, not because, you know, just like you're not a smart engineer or like you did scoping wrong. It's just because there is something that you didn't get a chance to predict or, you know, just like address early in the game and you haven't thought about this. And so baking a little bit more time in looking at the system at the internals, looking at what areas you would like to optimize and improve is quite critical. And so like baking estimates for product features as well as better engineering efforts and like refactors and optimizations that you plan to do along the way in order to ensure that you push um, a product in high quality. So like that's one thing. Another thing is um, every time we do some, you know, just like tech reviews um, with engineers, I always ask how much time did we bake, you know, just um, for dog fooding and testing, because the process is usually structured like you complete, like you do scoping, you run execution, then you dog food and test it, and then you need some time to you know just to address box. And so sometimes there is not enough time allocated for that. And so being very, I would say, realistic about how much potentially efforts would be devoted, it, again, depending on the complexity of the product you would need. So like, don't be, I think engineers sometimes, you know, just want to act like a hero is like, I can deliver something in them, you know, just like in a few weeks or in a month, but it's better to bake in an extra week or two weeks for this, you know, like um, the fires and potentially last minute surprises and regressions that you might run into rather than overcommit to something. And then, you know, just like um, start explaining, you know, just like why you're not delivering. Uh, one, uh, well, one other thing in regards to properly doing scoping is, uh, in, not just focusing on the timeline and like how much time it would take me, but be very deliberate about the milestones. And so like this milestone scoping approach is quite critical where you clearly break the pieces that need to be built. Um, and, you know, just like, um, like, and support that you, you, you might need. For example, if you are the engineer and you're given a project project, but you do believe that you need extra support, you do like, you shouldn't be shy or you shouldn't be, you know, just, um, hesitant about advocating for more engineering support and just like have a discussion with your manager directly of like, hey, I probably need another engineer to help if we want to, you know, just stay on track for the, you know, just like early preliminary timeline that the, the PM, for example, set up for us. So I think these are the critical things where, you know, just like milestone and being very detailed about, uh, you know, each component and piece that we have to integrate um, helps to, you know, just like ensure that you can stay on track. One other thing, Katerina, that I want to highlight, it's okay to be wrong, right? I think generally there is this perception of like, hey, the estimates that you provided are not really something that we stick to. And there was like a delay or slip by a few weeks. Is it a bad thing? I mean, if eventually the product gets to the users and especially in high quality, like it's okay. Two weeks is not a big deal. Sometimes a month is not a big deal. And so it's okay to be wrong in estimates. But one of the critical piece that I would recommend all of the engineering teams and engineers is uh, in order to wait until the last minute and last day of the deadline, you know, just like do a quite uh, just generic overview of how you're trending. And if you see that, you know, just for example, the project was evaluated to get completed in four weeks, but, it, you know, it's halfway through two weeks, you see that it would take you another, uh, you know, just like another month to complete. It's okay to talk about this, right? It's not okay to talk about this on the last day. And so this is where like senior engineers and tech leads need to really build the skill and mature of forcing the risks and being more proactive in communicating the delays. It's okay to be delayed in the like, it's okay to be delayed and communicated earlier in the game rather than you know just like delay the project and delivery and communicate it on the last day of the delivery. Um, so I think yeah, it's just also like the perception of uh, you know just. Uh, explaining why, like sometimes you're working with a new system, right? Or, you know, just like you didn't uh, identify earlier uh, in the scoping process that there would be a regression that would be caused because there are like two products built on top of each other. Um, so yeah, I would say, 
getting, you know, just like right estimations and, uh, you know, like sticking to them is definitely a hard problem. And I hope, you know, just like the, the steps that I've shared and like some small tips would help. But do remember that there is like, it's not the end of the world uh, if, uh, you know, just you would need extra two weeks to, to push things out of the door. Yeah, I think the most important thing here is managing expectations and communicating with people. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And ensuring that all of the stakeholders are aware. Uh, it's not like you're in a silo, you know, just like trying to rush things out and like delaying things and then like not communicating what's actually happening and what are the next steps and like why things are getting delayed. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one last question, which is uh, also practical, and then we'll go to, to the audience questions. We have a few. Um, when it comes to dealing with individual performance issues, what are some tips that you can share? Yeah, such a traditional engineering manager class. <laughs> so <laughs> talk about that. Um, so um, as I'm like equating, very similar to the process that we currently do planning for, you know, just like deliveries and projects and product that we're building, we do some planning and career growth conversations for engineers twice a year. So it's usually at the beginning of the year as well as mid the year. And so this planning is quite critical, right? Because you need to have a very transparent and open conversation with the engineer, of like what are the strong sides, but more importantly, what are the growth areas that you both, right, need to work on? It's not just a responsibility of the engineer to carry about their growth and just figure out how they can get to the next level or how they can close the gaps that they currently have. You as a manager is a critical and the most important, I would say, um, factor in ensuring that you're giving enough boost to the engineer. So this planning is something that, you know, just like matter is really focused on. There is no ad hoc, you know, just oh, like you can get to the next level, whatever. You know, like there is a rigorous planning of like what each engineer is expected to do, what they need to close in order to grow to the next level. And uh, similar to mid-cycle check in or like not mid-cycle check-ins, but like quarterly check-ins on the product delivery side, we have mid-cycle check-ins on like how the engineer is trending. So there are like a dedicated hour sessions where we're discussing whether we're on track, you know, like to hit individual milestones in regards to the growth. And um, another critical piece here is consist consistent feedback. I always encourage engineers, every time you finish a project and you'll deliver something, ask feedback from the people and key stakeholders you worked with, because it would help you to get the signals of, you know, are you performing according to your level? Are you meeting your expectations? So there are some really you know, big gaps that we need to close. And so consistent feedback is uh, really critical because it would help you on a timely basis to identify, uh, you know, just like, are you on track to the next level or not? And um, one other thing that I, you know, just created as a, you know, just tradition in my team, like mentorship is, uh, it, it sounds like a very, you know, like intuitive things, but I think mentorship should be structured at least the way I'm structuring it on my team is I always partner an engineer, junior engineer with a senior engineer on my team, specifically on the tech, um, on the tech um, um, and excellence, where, you know, just like there is uh, some kind of, some, some type of like coding sessions joined, like joint code, code sessions or like growth sessions. At the same time, I always set up mentorship sessions with engineers in outside of the org, right? So it's basically kind of like in the company, but external folks who could uh, provide some insights in regards to, you know, uh, like a transparency and open conversations. Because if you think about this, mentorship within the team sometimes may be tricky. Not all engineers feel comfortable talking about like the manager or, you know, just like performance with the people with whom they work on a daily basis, which is why mentorship on the team is really technical focused. But mentorship with a person outside of your org helps you, you know, just like to share your pain points. And so like, I think this double force from um, you know, just like different direction is always helpful to ensure that technically you're not falling behind, as well as, you know, just like you address all of the concerns regarding like the, the people, you know, just relationships and some maybe conflicts that you might have on the team, some like misunderstandings with managers or other stakeholders in the team that you might have. One other thing that uh, I, I think took me a little bit of a time to, you know, just like find as a kind of like also a way to bring perform like low performance to, you know, just like back on track is sometimes your team, right? Or your setup, your product might not be setting up the engineer to success. And it's not a fault of the engineer. It's like, it's, it's, it's just the surrounding and setup is not right. It might be maybe, you know, just like the engineer is working on an infra projects, but he's really passionate about consumer facing features and products. And so this is the time where it's quite critical 
for you as a manager to identify whether you set up the right environment for the engineer. And it's okay sometimes to have a very open and heart to heart conversation that, hey, the performance is not there. And it might be due to the motivation and lack of interest in the product. And, you know, you're probably not really excited about continuing to work in the space. And so let's make sure that we find you a better team. Let's make sure we find you the product that you would be more most passionate about to switch to. So I think that's, you know, something that we as managers not, not always think. And like we think that, oh, if it's, you know, like if the engineer is performing poorly, then it's time to, you know, just work harder to ensure we can bring him back on track. But no, sometimes it's just the environment is not right. And you need to invest more to find a better thriving and just like successful um, you know, just a yeah, environment where the engineer could um, could could continue growing. And uh, and um, maybe the last resort that you know just you could use is always like performance improvement plan. If you believe the environment is right, but there is lack of skills, then you know just there is a detailed plan that you're setting up for your engineer. And instead of doing you know just like weekly check-ins, like how things are trending, you would do like daily check-ins, and you would provide more handholding to the engineer, asking what are you know just like the main blockers, what are the main risks, what are the main challenges that the engineer are facing, and do more regular check to ensure that, uh, you know, just like this regular daily check-ins would help him eventually or give her eventually to get back on track. So those are the big tips and tricks that I would recommend to everyone. And I'm pretty sure all of you already aware as, uh, yeah, just quite, of the, like quite a few of them are standard um, in the industry. That's great. There are actually quite a few questions that uh, I want to go through, but let's uh, let's see how many we, we managed to get to. Sure. So That's there cool. is... Uh, there is one thing which asks what what is the approach uh, for when there are bugs and um, you know different things that are changing kind of the the priorities of the team at the moment. Um, nothing of the existing priorities is removed, so the scope stays the same, uh, and uh, the team can't manage the uh, the delivery on time. What's the approach? Uh, for, for management, basically, how do you approach management to tell them, okay, this is not right, we need to discope, we need to try to think uh, how to solve this? Yeah, uh, so I would say realistically, right, definitely people want, you know, like engineering teams do more than what they're capable of. And so as engineering managers, we're really responsible for advocating for the team and be very objective about what we can achieve. And, you know, just what makes sense to commit to and what makes sense to deprioritize. I don't remember there was a single situation where, you know, just scope creep would come half the way through without um without getting extra resources so i obviously you know just like you can overcommit right and say uh, and, you know, just like be nice and, you know, just like work 24 seven and like kill your team and eventually you will spend another half to restore it. But it's not very, you know, just like a very wise approach to do this. As a manager, to do the right two things. If something is really being added additionally to the queue that you already have, right? Um, you need to be very transparent with your leadership. And so like, you need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your leadership and with your manager directly about what realistically you can do, right? It's either, and usually the way I would approach is I would create a plan of like, hey, this is an extra scope, scope that is coming to our team and I need this extra number of engineers to deliver on this, right? And so uh, create a detailed plan of, you know, just like how the answer allocation would pan and like how many resources you need, what other teams you need partnership with in order to um, push things forward. Otherwise, if that's not a case and you really don't have a flexibility to add more team members to your team. Um, another uh, option would be bring the data scientist along with you, right? Like sit down and evaluate out of this 20 things and P0s that you have in the queue, what is the most valuable? Do you truly believe that all of these P0s are critical? Because sometimes, you know, like they can be reshuffled, right? And uh, based on the DS estimates, and uh, you can pre like pretty much, you know, like stack rank all of the projects in the list. And again, come to your manager and have a discussion that, hey, all of them are great. And we definitely can, you know, just like achieve this 10, right? This is our P0s and count fails that we're definitely committing to. The other ones are a stretch bucket. So it always helps me to, you know, be objective about what we're delivering as well as what is a stretch goal and set an expectation that we can't do this. Um, and so I honestly don't believe that at any point in leadership, if, if, if that's done properly and like with all of the details and rigor put in the estimation and, you know, just like 
planning, the leadership would be like, nope, you need to deliver it in like, you know, just with no extra support, no extra resources. And we don't care about how you do this. We just need to get it out of the door. I think maybe that would be a really red flag for me of like, am I in the right company? Because uh, yeah, just I, I, yeah, I was always... Uh, you know, just um, successful in like persuading and uh, like having an alignment. And I think leadership is at a point where um, they would listen to you, right? Like they would trust, you know, like the um, the planning and proposal that you're giving to them. Um, so it's either advocate for more resources or create count fails and stretch bucket and be transparent that stretch bucket is not guaranteed to happen. That's great. Um... There are two questions which are pretty related. Uh, one is how many people you manage, and the other one is what's the size of a team that an engineer manager can handle? So okay. just like a general... Yeah, great question. So usually I would say uh, one engineering manager, realistic, I mean, it a lot depends on your capacity, but um, average size and matter is like seven, 10 people. Sometimes there are smaller people, smaller teams, there are larger teams. Physically, I think my limit would be managing 13 people because at that point, you know, just like, because at, at the company, we actually are expected to have one-in-ones with all of the engineers on a weekly basis, right? So a lot of your time is being devoted to talking to the engineers, continuing growing with them, just uh, discussing the priorities, blockers, risks, etc. And so a lot of my time is focused on one and ones. And like 13 is a point where like, it's really hard to have, I mean, you might have 15 and 17 and there are managers who are managing more than that. Uh, but like, it's it's not as efficient at that time, you know, just like we start breaking, you know, just like a large team into smaller teams. So currently, I'm managing two teams. Um, and uh, currently, I have uh, 10 engineers, for, uh, 10 engineers and three open headcounts. So it's like it's it's literally like 13 engineers. So one team is five um, engineers and the other one is um, is eight engineers. You mentioned one and once there's one question related to that. Um, how often you, you mentioned once a week and yep. uh, what's your opinion uh, on one on ones? Maybe you can share something about, uh, you know, what a good way to conduct. Yeah. Meeting. That's a great question. And honestly, I've seen both approaches and I would tell you what worked for me quite well. When I was an engineer, the thing that I disliked is uh, when I come to my one-on-ones and, you know, like usually a standard practice is like, hey, let your engineers speak and let them drive one at once. Sure, that's great, right? But sometimes, you know, like you as an engineer also need some guidance or like, uh, you know, just uh, leadership opinion and, you know, just like some insights about like bigger things that they have in mind. And so I really disliked when my one-on-ones when I was an engineer would be solely driven by me and the manager would be just listening and, you know, like reacting to things that I would do. So the way I structure my one-on-ones is before every one-on-one, the day before that, I actually plan the agenda. I have roughly, you know, just like three to seven topics that I want to discuss. And the topics might be different. It can be about person's growth and just prom promo package and like career growth. It can be about, you know, just the project that he's working or um, her is working on and uh, you know, like things that we need to like revisit, like data we need to pull up, etc. It can be something company critical. For example, if there is a big thing that is happening in the company regarding to like planning, some like benefit changes, anything we can discuss, this type of things. But I always have an agenda of like from three to seven topics that I would like to discuss with the engineer. And then we have a joint dog. And I always, again, as I mentioned, like to me, an engineer is my partner. They always would add their agenda items to the list. And so it's always a mutual conversation conversation where we would come to the meeting and it would be like, hey, is there something critical you would like to address right now? Or we can go through my agenda list and then uh, and then we can uh, dive into yours. And so it's always like a mutual discussion rather than, you know, like putting this pressure on the engineer of like, hey, drive it the way you want to drive. I mean, if that works for the engineer, sure, like they can do this. But especially junior folks need a lot of guidance. And so like the, yeah, like for me, it's basically a contributions from both sides. And I always get ready for my one-on-ones uh, the day before that in terms of time management do you do all one-on-ones in one day or do you shift them that's, to the a, week? that's a great question so like with smaller i try to do one-on-ones for one team on one day and then one-on-ones for, for the for the other team on another day uh yeah because honestly like putting them all in one day requires <laughs> quite a lot of talking and guidance energy drain balance it out so it's usually yeah just one day for one team and then the other day for the other team mm -hmm. that's great 
Uh, I think this is uh, a good question to wrap things up. Uh, we are running out of time. Maybe some final insight that you want to share? Yeah, some final insight. I think, you know, just going back to your first question in regards to benefits uh, and like pros and cons of being an engineer and manager and like how to adapt to this role. I had a lot of hesitation whether, you know, just like I, you know, just management is really the career that I want to pursue going forward. And so like in full transparency, like as when I switched, I, I had a lot of retrospectives internal of like, shall I try it? Shall I not try it? And one thing that I would definitely recommend and, you know, just like it wouldn't, we would advise everyone to do is always push yourself to the role that, uh, you know, like you've never experienced because it's 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 not an end stand. You can try it and then like change things, but never miss um, miss up on the opportunities where uh, you're giving something new to try. And then just because of the fear that you might not succeed in this role, you would not sign up for this. And so, uh, yeah, I'm quite grateful that my career turned up out this way where I was really open to jump on a new journey and try something that I didn't have skills for, but I hope I have successfully developed them over the last uh, three years. Based on this conversation, I'm, I'm sure that you have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia, uh, again, for accepting my invite for this uh, chat today. It was very insightful. I mean, for me personally, I'm sure that it was for all of our attendees. Uh, this will go on YouTube um, very soon. So uh, for everyone who didn't manage to join, they will be able to watch it there. Um, and this is our final fireside chat for this year. So we're coming back after the holidays. And in the meantime, you can browse through our past videos there. There's a lot of interesting content on similar topics uh, as this one. And Yuli, I hope to have you again uh, sometime in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katerina, again, for the invite. And thank you for everyone who joined us uh, for today's session. And yeah, if anyone would love to connect and ask uh, more questions about, you know, like experience and like tips and tricks, how to uh, to do career switch or, you know, just like how to be an efficient manager, like any any type of questions that might be coming to people's mind. I'm uh, quite active on LinkedIn. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for, um, for, for the attention and wishing everyone ending this year strongly and achieving all of the goals and like crushing them and exceeding them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day and evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.